good morning and happy new year. It's uh, kind of funny how quickly that feels like old news, hey? It was only six days ago, you guys. And technically the first time we've seen each other since the new year, so happy new year. Uh, I, I want to reiterate what Rod has already spoken, that just how much I really valued uh, how our year as a church community came to a close last Sunday. The, the opportunities uh, in our prayer and communion service together. And I was so honored to be able to pray with many of you, to hear your stories, to share your burdens. And I am confident that God is going to continue to be at work with what you have asked him. Because our God is always at work. And when God is at work, it is for our benefit. As we enter this new year, it's my hope that we carry this posture of confidently bringing our requests before God with us. I think it is what will serve us best as we take a step into whatever 2024 has in store for us. And beginning a new year is so often filled with hopes and anticipations of all the good that will come in it. It's, do you ever feel like it's kind of like packing for a last-minute trip? It's like we're excited, uh, we have a bit of an idea of where we're going, but there's always a bit of a question of like, am I actually prepared for this thing? Uh, on time to time, when I'm feeling really romantic, I like to take my wife on a surprise date. All you need to know is clear your schedule, I'll take care of the rest. And I can anticipate the questions that will come of, well, what am I supposed to wear? I don't want to be overdressed. I definitely don't want to be underdressed. Is it going to be hot or cold? Are we inside or outside? Are we going to be sitting down somewhere or do I need to dress with something to be active? It's okay. I know what we need. It's on a need-to-know basis. I'll let you know when you need to know, right? What do you need this new year? Many of us acknowledged that last week, but what new needs will this year bring? We really don't know, do we? Uh, what, what will happen within our jobs? Will we need to get a new one? Why do we always go so negative with this stuff? Maybe you get a promotion. Maybe your, your need is the capacity to be able to lead well in that new role. I think we're tempted to go to the negative because that's where our anxieties are. What about our relationships? Will we, what ones do we need to press into? What ones do we need to pull back from? What about our health? What about our physical condition? How many of you still have an appendix? Now, for those of you who don't, you are not prepared for when that thing burst. If you reflect back on your year, I think you'll recognize there was a lot that you didn't anticipate. I know that makes the anxiety levels of the room rise up pretty quickly. That's okay. Bear with me. We're going to deal with that in a few moments. What if the same posture we had last week of confidently bringing our requests before a generous God was our driving force for 2024? Because even though we don't yet know what we need, our God does. So this morning, I'm excited to share with you one of my absolute favorite Bible verses, uh, passages that outlines for us a God who knows our needs and how to fill those needs, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask that you'd stand with me as we pray this together, uh, and then we'll start digging into it. It'll be up on the screen, and I know that there's going to be a, a tension of we've all kind of learned this with different translations and different wording, so for the sake of being able to speak it together, we'll, we'll tr do our best to stick with what's on the screen. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying with me. The Lord's Prayer begins what we just read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, but I want us to start a few verses earlier as we dig into the, the depth of what this passage reveals for us, starting at verse 5. Now, this section of Scripture is, is just one piece of what we call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is laying out what the life of a disciple looks like, addressing matters of the heart, our intentions, our motivation behind our actions. He's saying that following Jesus requires a different posture, a different mentality than what the rest of the world is used to. 
Now Jesus is turning to his disciples, to this crowd, and, and teaching them how to pray. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, we read, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, what we see at first is that there are some who are living with this distorted view and practice of prayer. Hypocrites who say one thing, but do another thing. They say that their prayer life is for the the benefit and the value of their connection with God, but they're actually more concerned with how other people think. It's good for us to pray publicly. It's good for us to pray with other people. And I think what Jesus is saying is that a fruitful public presence is going to flow from a genuine, private relationship, and not the other way around. And it's easy for us to undermine the significance of our private prayer but our God sees what is in private and rewards us. Rewards that genuine pursuit of him. So yes, let's continue to pray with one another, but allow those times to be enriched by our own private times of prayer where that connection with God is developed. And when we have that level of comfortability in prayer, all of a sudden we're less concerned about what other people think or less concerned if we're using the right words when we pray. Maybe sometimes we've avoided praying with other people altogether because we just doubt that the words we have to contribute are are good enough. And if these are the things that we have felt before, let's keep reading and see what Jesus has to say about them. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. First contrasted with a hypocritical prayer, uh, saying one thing, do another, saying I'm concerned about my relationship with God. Actually, I'm just concerned about what other people think about me. Now Jesus is contrasting with the Gentiles. A Gentile is essentially anyone who didn't believe in God. Now at this time, there is most people believed in some type of deity or in multiple gods, false gods, and would have some type of prayer life, a lot of it focused on uh, the, more you, the more words you use, the better it is. Highly concerned about word usage. It says the Gentiles heap up empty phrases. They think they'll be heard for their many words. It makes me think of the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. They're going toe to toe, trying to figure out who serves the one true God. So they put this test together. They say, we have this altar set up here. Let's both pray to our gods and see whatever God can light this thing on fire. That's how we know the one true God is. And the prophets of Baal go first and they spend the entire day imploring to their false god, screaming, crying out, shouting, begging, pleading that this God would do something. They're heaping up their empty phrases to a God who cannot hear them. And the longer the day goes on, the more aggressive they become in their approach. But the words weren't able to produce anything. Because it's a Gentile idea to think that you can change God's mind because of your many words. This idea that we think God will respond to us if we use the right words. That's not a Christian idea. That's a Gentile idea. And it's even more of a Gentile idea to think that we would need to. To think that we need to convince God of what we need. To think that we need to convince God of what is best for us. To think that we need to change God's mind. It's a false view of God to believe that God is a puppet that can be controlled and manipulated by us if we unlock the right phrases to use. Because he knows what his children need before we ask, and he already wants our best. The effectiveness of our prayers is not based on word selection, and we're turning to a solid relationship with the living God. So then the natural question to follow is, why ask? If God already knows what we need before we ask, and if by asking we're not going to be changing or convincing God of something different, then why are we asking? 
anything. And I think this prayer that Jesus outlines for us is actually not to instruct God. It's to instruct ourselves. To look to God as our provider who delights in giving us what is good and to recognize what he has already given us. Prayer effectively connects us with God and brings us to a confidence that he is willing and able to provide according to his good character. And since this is the power and the love of the God that we are praying to, Jesus tells us, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I love the intro of this prayer because it launches us into communion with God by using a word that we so often overlook. Do you know what word I'm thinking of? You're going to guess it's hallowed. You're wrong. Think earlier than that. The word, our. Think about this for a moment. Jesus is on this mountainside speaking to likely hundreds of people who are interested in following his ways, who are learning what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus leans into them and says, this is how we pray our Father. He doesn't turn to them and say, pray to my Father. He doesn't say, pray to the Father of the Holy Son. He says, our Father. And right off the start, this prayer places us in a community of faith, in a corporate pursuit of our Heavenly Father. The the hypocrite prayer Jesus said, that's selfishly focused for your own glory. But Jesus says, this prayer places you in a story that is far bigger than yourself. You are a part of something bigger. Taking this one step further, Jesus is included in this collective hour. And not only does this prayer unite us with other believers and is designed to be prayed together, we are being united to Jesus, recognizing that we have been elevated to the status of child of God and a co-heir with Christ, our Father. It's so simple, but so significant. And this Father is not just Father, but he is the heavenly Father. He is Father in perfect form, with perfect love, perfect power. This fusion of close intimacy and transcendent sovereignty, which means that he, above all else, can be trusted. Again, compared to this Gentile idea of prayer that we would need to convince God. We don't need to convince God because we're not lowly beggars before God. We are his children, and we can trust him. And this is the posture that we take when we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is a bit of a weird word. It's not one that we commonly use in our vocabulary. Uh, It means to make something holy to set it apart for a distinct purpose. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, we could just as well say, uh, make your name holy. God, set your name apart from every other name. So let's clarify for a moment. The name of God is already holy. So when we're praying this, we're not saying, hey, God, pull your act together. You're losing your holiness. No, we're we're praying, praying that the holiness of God's name would be realized by all people. This plays out in two ways. Consequently, it's a prayer for us who bear his name to live in the same holiness, to live as a demonstration of the attributes of God because God is using us as agents to display his good character on this earth by transforming us to be holy as he is holy. But on the other hand, it's a recognition that, wow, we are not there yet, and we're never going to get that far in this lifetime. So it's a prayer, make your name holy beyond what we are capable of doing. God, act on behalf of yourself so that the world may know the truth of your character. Beyond what you and I are able to do. When we pray, hallowed be your name, we're praying, God, let your name be acknowledged and respected in my life and across the whole world for your glory. For God... You are a God who is distinct among anything else that we place our trust in because you are a God who hears our prayers and you are a God who lovingly responds to us. The next phrase in our prayer, your kingdom come. The kingdom of the one true God. The God who is above all other gods. Jesus' ministry was to introduce the kingdom on earth. When Jesus came, it says that he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And we live in this tension of the already and the not yet. We experience this kingdom in part, but not yet in its full expression. So to pray your kingdom and come is this prayer of this desire, this longing to experience the fullness of the kingdom. Longing for the day when Jesus reigns over all things and restores all things. And so many of our requests we make to God are in line with this statement as we bring the brokenness of our situations, the brokenness of our world before God in prayer. We want to see the fullness of the kingdom of God. We want to see the fullness of restoration. That's what we're invited to pray for. But it's also a prayer for the kingdom to come today in a way that men and women submit to the rule of Jesus. Because ultimately, that's where the kingdom is. Where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere that says that Jesus is king. That is where the kingdom of God stands. And, and similarly to hallowed be your name, we're not praying for something that isn't already true because God's name is holy, because his kingdom is here, at least in part. We're praying for this truth to be realized, that people would submit to the sovereignty of God. To pray for the kingdom is to pray for the authority of Jesus and the submission to his ruling, the submission to his will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To pray for the kingdom of God uh, is to pray for the will of God. Because when God's kingdom comes, his will will be accomplished. <clears throat> Jesus demonstrates this really well for us. Because when Jesus is in the garden in the final moments of his life praying, he, he says this, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The surrender of your own will for the submission to the will of God. Now, praying for God's will doesn't mean that we need to stop making our personal requests. It doesn't mean that we have to stop giving God our desires. But what it does is it changes our posture from pleading, saying, please, 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 God, this is what I want, this is what I need, I know what's best, to submission. Saying, God, this is my heart's desire. This is what I want, this is what I feel like I need, I give it to you, yet, not what I will, what you will. This is challenging for us, isn't it? We find security and control. To trust someone else with that is really difficult. But remember, it's the Gentile way to think that we need to convince God of what is good, because our God already knows what we need, even before we ask. We can trust in the surrender of our own will because our will is earth, and God's will is heaven on earth. God's will is far greater than our own, on earth as it is in heaven. A profound statement, uh, and one that's just not relevant to the will of God, but actually uh, encompasses every statement that we've said so far. Hallowed be your name on earth, as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to taste and see the fullness of God. That is what Jesus is leading us to pray for. This is the first half of the Lord's Prayer. And what did we notice about these three statements that Jesus is leading us to make? That everything we're praying for is simply for God to be at work for the sake of God. Did you catch that? This word, your. How will be your name? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We're praying for God to act on behalf of God. And even though we're petitioning for God to be at his own work, it's for our benefit. The work of God is for our benefit whenever God is at work. It is for our benefit, and God is always at work. But yet, even so, even with this mindset, I think we often really hesitate and pull back from bringing our requests before God. I think sometimes we get in this mindset that maybe I'm asking God for too much. Well, maybe if I want God to answer me, I should just, like, maybe one request at a time would be good. I think we've fallen into the trap that we're not asking God for too much. We're asking God for too little. Because God always has more that he wants to give us. 
So let's enter the second half of our prayer. The first half is identified by these three, your petitions, asking God to be at work. And now we're going to recognize that a shift has taken place. This is our opportunity to place our requests in. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. The request for our daily needs and our provisions. Bread is our sustenance. It's the most basic need of our nourishment. Now, the Canada Health Food Guide would probably disagree with that, but given the world at this time, bread was recognized as that's your basics. And naturally, it calls to mind the Israelites wandering in the desert after being freed from Egypt, eating manna that God had provided for them daily. The Israelites had just experienced God's miraculous deliverance, yet they were ready to go back to Egypt because they were hungry. So God provided for them by giving them manna, this bread-like substance, every day, daily bread. But the rules were only take enough for today, because tomorrow new bread will come. God was proving that he was the one who provides. He was teaching them to trust in not just the miracle itself, but in the one who produced the miracle. Don't trust in the miracle, trust in the miracle worker. And when Jesus enters the scene, he communicates this message again when he multiplies the loaves and fishes, saying that not only can he provide physical bread, but spiritual bread as well. After Jesus uses a few small fish and loaves, uh, and he breaks them and multiplies them and feeds thousands of people with them, enough that there are leftovers to spare, he makes this profound statement saying, I am the bread of life. Jesus himself is our provision. He is far more than bread that barely gets us through the day. He is our provision and abundance. There is enough for everyone and there is enough left over. He is the one that finally and fully satisfies our hunger. Give us this day our daily bread as recognizing that God can both provide for our physical needs and our spiritual needs. There's a daily filling a daily sustaining that comes from our Heavenly Father. And there is a freedom to approach him and ask for him. God, this is what I'm lacking today. Provide for me. Provide for my needs. And you can pray it again tomorrow and the next day. The physical needs are important. The spiritual ones, even more so. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is a big one, isn't it? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and walk? The question Jesus asks the religious leaders after he offers forgiveness to the paralytic that was lowered through the roof on a mat. Which is easier to say? Matthew 9, verse 6, in the account of this story, Jesus turns to the leaders and says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Because Jesus can do both, and he has the authority to do both, and he can do both in an instant. Again, highlighting that there is a great physical need, and he can offer that but the spiritual need is greater. He offers that too. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is a mark of our spiritual health, our willingness to forgive one another. Do you find the sequence of this sentence intriguing? Uh, Maybe it kind of feels backwards, because it doesn't sound like it's making the assumption that we've already forgiven other people before we come and ask for God's forgiveness? Is it backwards, or, or do I actually need to forgive others before I am forgiven? What an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. Now, if we flip this and consider, wow, I actually have an opportunity to be forgiven from all of my sins. All I have to do is forgive the people around me. Man, that is a bargain. Sign up for that deal. But that's not what God says. Because that mindset, that attitude, takes one big step across the line of what we call works-based theology, saying that you have earned 
your forgiveness, and you have not. It has been given to you. It was a gift. What does the Bible say about salvation? It says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It is by grace you have been saved. This is not your own doing. It is the work of God. So forgiveness holds a lot of weight. But I don't think the statement that Jesus is making, I don't think this prayer is intended to be a threat on our salvation. No, this prayer is intended to provide uh, the disciples the posture that we are to pray on, pray in, giving us the marks of true discipleship. Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow me. This laying down of our old life, of our old ways, to follow the life that Jesus has demonstrated and called us to live. Now, if we're unwilling to pursue that path, the call of Jesus to take up our cross, if, if we're counting the cost and saying, maybe the Christ-like life isn't worth it, well, then this isn't just a matter of an instance of forgiveness or unforgiveness that we're talking about. This is uh, an entire hesitation to declare that Jesus is Lord. And that is a different situation. An unwillingness to forgive only stores up bitterness in our hearts. Through forgiveness, there is freedom. So if you have been wronged by someone, if there is a need for forgiveness, Jesus is not taking back your salvation and saying, you forgive and then I will give this back to you. No, our God does not work like that. But this does identify that a lack of forgiveness is a point of disconnect between us and God. Forgiveness restores the relationship. Forgiveness of one another restores our relationship with God further. Yes. Jesus has the authority to forgive all of our sins. And he calls us to a life of extending that forgiveness to others as well. So we continue to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And man, in those times when we're contemplating if we're going to forgive someone or if we're going to get even with someone, temptation can easily wiggle its way in there. I don't think it's a coincidence that this, uh, request, or this prayer for leading away from temptation follows a prayer of forgiveness. I don't think that this statement lead us not into temptation is a coincidence that it's the closing of our prayer. Because even though temptations come in all shapes and forms and they can hit us from every side, I think the one biggest temptation that each and every one of us is con confronted with, and confronted with often, is to neglect every truth that we have prayed so far. Our temptation is going to say belittle it. It's not that big of a deal. God doesn't actually function like that. God doesn't actually provide like that. God uh, doesn't actually care for that, or at least not about me. That's our temptation. Lead us not into temptation. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are praying, lead us away from our human understanding, our human desires, and lead us underneath your authority. It's a prayer of humility. It's a confession of our weakness a confession of our dependency on God. Temptations are bound to come. So when they do, we pray, deliver us from evil. Jesus is the only way to overcome our temptations, and we are fully equipped to engage in the battle and be confident that victory belongs to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. First of all, meaning you're not alone in your temptations. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Because our God knows what? He knows our needs before we ask him. Now, it's true that in and of yourself, time and time again, you're going to fail and fumble and fall. But we don't act on our own authority. Jesus is the source of our freedom, and he is instructing us to pray for spiritual preservation so that we can stand firm against the schemes of the evil one. The authority of Jesus dwells within us and is our very power to overcome. Jesus' ministry is to set us free because he is a loving God that desires to give us good gifts. So what do we do with this prayer? We turn towards God with our requests, and we pray as he's instructed us to pray. 
I believe that this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is a prayer for every season, for every circumstance in life, especially, and I found it especially helpful when you're at a loss of, I just don't know what else to pray anymore. He knows our needs. Jesus has provided us the words because he knows what we need before we ask the Lord's Prayer. Okay, but what will this prayer change? It helps us to navigate our perspective and keep us grounded on a God who is far bigger than us. It puts God in his rightful place as first. We recognize our position and submission to a mighty God. Remember, we're instructing ourselves in this prayer more than we are instructing God. And by praying this, we're not saying that, hey God, this is what you need to know. We're saying, this is what I need to be reminded of, that you are a holy God with a righteous kingdom and a perfect will, one who meets my needs, grows my character and my relationships, and grants me the authority to be able to thrive in this life. I think far too often we isolate this prayer. But if we keep reading on the few verses underneath it, I think we discover a really practical application in the following section. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, starting at 25, and I have a few verses that I want to read and share with you. Uh, if you want to, uh, like, take this space to reflect on what has already been said through the Lord's Prayer, you have my blessing to do that. Or you can follow along with these words on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Why? Because he made them and he knows their needs and he lovingly cares for them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? For you are of such greater value. You're not only God's creation, you are God's masterpiece. You are God's prized possession. You are worth more to God than that. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. That sounds familiar at this point, right? When else did we hear this? Don't pray like the Gentiles. Why? Because their prayers are focused on convincing God what is best for us. And man, if that is what our posture towards God is, is that, okay, I need to convince God of what is best for me, then yes, you are going to have high anxiety every day. Because that much power and authority was not meant for you to carry. Jesus has a different lifestyle in store for us. Because he knows our needs and proclaims that you are worthy of, of receiving the goodness of God. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Hallowed be your name. May it be recognized as king, and your will be revealed as greater than our own. The first half of our prayer, the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness our daily provisions, our forgiveness, our deliverance. The second half of our prayer, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what can we anticipate for the year ahead? We don't know. And that's okay, because our God does. And our God will provide for us. Our God cares for us. Our God is present in our time of need because he knows our needs before we ask. So church, as we carry on through this new year, make this prayer your anthem. Use this prayer as your posture towards God in a constant surrender to the goodness of our Heavenly Father, being confident of this, 
that he is trustworthy to turn to and you are worthy to receive his goodness. Let's pray together. Jesus, you have provided for us in abundance. Help us to remember, help us to take it to heart, the truths of who you are, God. Your ways are so much greater than our own ways. So we turn to you in our time of need. Jesus, that you would fulfill us. Maybe it's in a way we expect. Maybe it's in a new ways that we don't expect. But we turn to you confidently with trust, saying that if anyone or anything can do it, it is you. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your word that you have given to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.